<laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Scoop. I'm your host, Damon Hatfield, and joining me this week is Tina Amini. Hi, everybody. Sam Claiborne. Howdy. And Justin Davis. Scoop. And we've got a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about uh, what we're what we've been playing, which includes uh, something a little bit older for me because there's just absolutely nothing else coming out anytime soon. Uh, and we're going to talk about the next step in the evolution of Final Fantasy VII Remake. But first, uh, an important announcement about the future of GameScoop here on YouTube. If you're listening to this show, you can skip ahead a couple minutes. This does not concern you. This is only for GameScoop on YouTube. <laughs> uh, GameScoop is moving to a new channel. IGN is starting a new channel called IGN Games. That's going to be the new home of all of the podcasts, including GameScoop, Podcast Beyond, Podcast Unlocked, and Nintendo Voice Chat. So starting next week, future episodes will not be uploaded here any longer. They're going to be uploaded at IGN Games. We hope you will join us on this new adventure and uh, subscribe to IGN Games and uh, continue watching the show. I realize this will be an inconvenience for some of you. I apologize about that. It's not our intention, uh, but we, ha we have put some things in place that I think will make this migration as painless as possible. We'll create a new playlist on the new channel on IGN Games for GameScoop, and you can save that playlist. It should be a very easy way to find future episodes. Of course, we post links to new episodes in our Facebook community group. So if you're not uh, a, a member of the GameScoop group on Facebook, make sure you join that. Um, and then also the, the YouTube algorithm has gotten pretty good at knowing what you want to watch. So if you've been watching GameScoop on YouTube all this time, YouTube's still going to show you new episodes, even though they're being uploaded to this new channel. So that's... Uh, Damon, yes. it's times like this where I really appreciate that we're the only gaming podcast. I know. It just makes it easier. Yeah, it'll make it easier to find the only gaming podcast. Uh, that's the news. Nothing else is changing. Same cast, uh, same goose camp, co-op mages, same video game 20 questions. It's just going to be happening on this new channel, which IGN has started to, to make it uh, a little bit easier to find the content you're looking for. I know in IGN Maine, it's like a fire hose of content being published every day. You've got game reviews, movie reviews, game trailers, mm -hmm. movie trailers, news videos, daily fix, whatever is new coming to Netflix. You've got trailers for that going up too. So IGN Games is just going to be very focused on games. It's going to have podcasts and other like feature stuff like top 10 lists and, and that sort of thing. I'm sure you have questions. Ask them in the comments. I will answer uh, all of them that I see. You can always hit me up on Twitter. Uh, or you ask questions in uh, the Games Group Facebook group, and uh, I will address all of your concerns. Thank you so much for supporting the show all these years here on its own YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get into the show. Uh, we begin with what we've been playing, and I, I know that Sam has just been having a great time with Ghosts and Goblins. <laughs> yeah, I gave up on that game. Um, that 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 game, I, I don't like that series for what it is, so I, I, I respect that people do. But like the idea of that series is that it's hard, and I think that's fine. Like it, it's it's Cuphead if you haven't you know played a, a game like that where it's like your movement's really restricted, your jump is shitty, and your uh, movement is very slow, and everything feels like molasses. But the enemies are really fast, mm. and they're really good at hitting you. And so why I don't like that is that I want to feel like I'm a badass when I play a game, right? Like I don't want to feel worse than the enemies. Yeah. I want to feel like matched to them at least. And so it's really frustrating for me to play that type of game. Um, and then also like they, they changed this game out to just have like new, gra new graphics. And I, I will say that I didn't like the graphics at, at first. And I still don't like them, but like the animations are, are neat and everything. But like what I need from Ghost of Goblins is what Castlevania did. Like, Give me something more to do, something extended, something interesting, something in, you know that you develop on the you, you kind of develop the theme of Ghosts and Goblins. This is just Ghosts and Goblins with polygons, and like I just don't I just don't want to play that. And so I, I turned it on, like I even set it on like the five hit mode or whatever, four yeah. hits instead of like two hits or whatever it defaults to, and try to get through it. But I am on a like the third boss fight now, and I just like I can't. I just <laughs> there's just no point. But I started playing a much better game, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, well, I'm excited to hear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I haven't even jumped into Ghosts and Goblins. It's the look of it that's a turnoff to me. I, I hate the way it looks. Yeah. If they had gone this part that some... we're showing right now looks pretty cool. There's like cool painterly, neat effects to it. Uh, but then, yeah, you need you play it. It's just like it looks like a a 3D game adapted to look like a 2D game, which is not my style. It looks like a mobile game to me. I don't know if they if they'd gone with some really cool pixel art, I would be much more obliged to check it out. But what is the new game that you've been playing instead? Well, it's one that uh, rec was recommended by Tina, but she's mm -hmm. playing too. So I'll let her take it away and then I'll, I'll patch it because I'm not as far as her. 
Yeah, take it away, I Tina. think I'm I'm in chapter five of Yakuza Like a Dragon. Oh um, wow! And it, yeah, it's been a minute. I've been I've been like had that on my horizon to play at some point. Cyberpunk got in the way of Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed got in the way, or revisiting Assassin's Creed got in the way of yakuza but finally this weekend i started playing um like a dragon and i really like it the one caveat is if you do not like cutscenes and you are <laughs> not the type of person to watch your video games this game is not for you now a lot of the dialogue is skippable um there are cut scenes like cinematic cut scenes that you can skip the entirety of the scene then there are um like voiced dialogue uh, options where you can skim through line by line. Uh, and then there's like unvoiced lines of dialogue too. I mean, it's a huge, mm -hmm. like heavy RPG. So there's just tons of character building, just tons of backstory, um, even within your own character, because it's a new character from the series overall of what uh, Yakuza fans are used to. This is my first Yakuza game. So it didn't Same. make a difference for me. Um, but yeah, the, the premise is basically you're like low rung on the Yakuza and then some stuff happens and you have some other allies. I don't want to spoil anything, even though the general premise is not exactly a spoiler, but for some of you, it may be. Um, but yeah, you have a, you get a gang of friends at a point of time and they're just like a very random cast of characters uh, with very random abilities. And there's a lot of like sophomore humor if you're not super into that either, but there <laughs> it's not a, it's not the most gross. It's, it's super goofy and funny, especially the juxtaposition no. of some of like the serious stuff alongside some of the goofier stuff it kind of kind of takes you by surprise so it, it's funny in that sense but yeah i burned through and now i'm like midway through chapter five and really enjoying it justin has been singing the praises of yakuza for years yeah well like a dragon is it's uh, this might be the one example where a long-running really well-liked franchise has successfully switched genres like it's not a spin-off. It's not like you know an RPG or different version of a thing. It's like they just took the game and changed its genres from a brawler to an RPG, and everyone was so. I was wondering about that. Everyone was That's so what skeptical, they did, right? but then Like a Dragon won everybody over, right? Like, and it's become mm -hmm. like they pulled off this magic trick of for like maybe even for one of the first times. It's like they're like seven games in, and now it's like no, you can just start here. It's fine um and and they really really pulled it off with a with a new character new genre new gameplay but the same i haven't played like a dragon yet it's still in my backlog but yakuza has always been so excellent at mixing the melodrama and this and the really really seriousness with just such silly side quests and ridiculousness as well and it doesn't feel like it should work but it, it really does yeah, uh, to give you an example, I saw several adult males in baby diapers. So that's uh, just mm. one side quest that you can stumble cool. on. <laughs> um, Sam, you're, a, you're enjoying it as well? Yeah, I couldn't put it down. I started this weekend too, and like I'm at you know two and a half. I'm in the middle of chapter two, and uh, it's uh, and they're long chapters. There's a uh, it's really cool because you know it's it's really about a place in Japan. I think it's uh, uh, somewhere near Yokohama because they always talk about Yokohama. I think they go between them or something, but uh, it's just a cool neighborhood. And like, you kind of get to know that there's like a Sega arcade. It's so cool. It's it's called like, yeah, it's like this giant Sega building. And then there's like all these, uh, you know, fake businesses with like hilarious names, just, just like in Japan, like everything has, if it has an English uh, sign, sometimes it has really funny words on it. Uh, so it has all that. And it feels like a really cool uh, set in Japan game. Uh, you, uh, you you learn characters backstories and like a really cool way um you kind of like this you know was already mentioning like you watch a lot but it's done so well it's just like it, it's its own thing it's its own vibe i don't normally you know uh, i'm not going to say that it tells a story in a particularly great way compared to other things but it's for a game it's doing a really good job of it and i just can't put it down and then the rpg stuff is just funny it's like it's like uh it's like a play like they, it's tongue in cheek. They know about RPGs and RPG memes and like how that would work with a, you know, a mafia setting, a Yakuza setting. It's like hilarious. It's like really funny how it works. Like you, you beat up street punks constantly. It's just, yeah. that's what you're encountering, you know? They're really self-aware about that because they constantly mention Dragon Quest because that's Ichiban yeah. Kasuga is the protagonist. That's his favorite game. Um, and so they're constantly like uh, making references like, oh, can you go do this favor for me? It's just like in a video game. You know, you meet this character, they're mm -hmm. non-playing and then, you know, not exactly along those lines, but they um, they definitely poke little video gamey jokes like that quite often. They're, they're quite pleased with themselves and I in turn am pleased with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is Like a Dragon supposed to be a good place to enter 
the, the series. Yeah, it's a new protagonist, and yeah, it's it's meant it was designed partially to be like a new on ramp mm-hmm. for people that don't want to have to play six other Yakuza games. Yeah, it's a different protagonist, I believe, different setting and just different premise and style overall. It's honestly super easy gameplay wise, mm-hmm. at least five chapters in. Um, so there's definitely, and I was actually thinking about that that age old scoop question about snacking and video gaming. Cause boy, is it easy to snack and eat full <laughs> yeah. meals while you're just watching cutscenes of Yakuza. Yeah. So I legitimately just didn't have to take a break between uh, any of my meals. Cause I would just wait until a lengthy cutscene and I was good to go. You can see that grainy. Well, first of all, Tina already talked about this a little bit, but like, you know, this is a game where like you can get the gist of things. If we were talking to somebody by skipping dialogue, right? You can do that. But then you'll see that kind of like grainy compressed effect come up. You're like, all right, Time to sit back because this is going to be a cutscene, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then it goes forever. And you can put your controller down and watch it, and it's usually really funny. Um, they do a good job. There's some dark stuff in it too. Like there's like a mm, like a background uh, plot line about like taking a baby and putting it in like a locker to hide it from the the yakuza, and it's like super spooky and scary and tense, and uh, and everything's okay. But it's really interesting. <laughs> I, th- I think I might, um, let's see, which ones have I played? I played zero, one, and two. And then I, I haven't played three, four, five yet. Although I own a man there on game pass now. And so I know that like a dragon, um, is, you know, new characters, new setting, but there's, you know, cameos and callbacks and it is referencing the whole franchise where you don't need to have played them all to get that. But if, right. if you have played them all, you're picking up on context and stuff. And so, for that reason, I avoided Like a Dragon because I don't want to spoil myself on 3, 4, and 5. But um, I think I've just decided that um, I don't care, and I'm going to play it anyway. <laughs> just now? You just decided that now? Yeah, just now. Nice. We're yeah. a good influence. The, yeah. only thing I don't like, uh, the only thing I don't like about the game so far, and maybe there's just a setting that I haven't seen for it yet, but you can't toggle the map view. Like, it's only always mm-hmm. pointing north, and I can't have that. I can't do only pointing north. What is north up with maps. that? It's yeah. so different mm-hmm. than other maps. It's so crazy. It's like a whole different way of doing a map where it's like there's this like pink arrow floating out there somewhere and you have to like run towards it. So you have kind of always have to like orient yourself. Is that what it is, though? Is that it's it's, it's pointing, pointing no- north? Yeah, instead of- like in racing games, you usually get the option because people just internalize like when they have to make a yeah. turn and whatnot a little bit differently than one another. And I think like the, the if you're a cool gamer, you always have it pointing north. No. Yeah, I was gonna but. say that's why I'm so that's why I'm making my confused face right now. It's I'm like, do you not want it always pointing north? Yeah, that's that's what people like. But I, including GPS, by the way, I need to be oriented around my point of view. So it just it just makes more sense in my brain that way. Like the rotating type of map, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that Where is you're the really focal common. point rather than north being the focal point. Yeah, that's. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I believe. I would th- say that's just as common, but yeah, I never thought about toggling between them. But the map in this game is like is super confusing, and it's also like supposed to be because you're in these little alleys in Japan and you're running around and stuff. And this is a yeah, game where I'm use... like walking more often than running too, because it feels weird oh, to run sometimes. And... Same, and and you have to, you know, I'm I'm running more than I am taking taxis because right. you, you start off like you're supposed to be super poor, and like you know, although you you quickly ramp up money because it is a video game, as they say <laughs> repeatedly in the video game. Um, but yeah, it costs money to take cabs. And I think they only go within certain okay, spheres okay. around like certain parts of the map. But the whole point of running around in the uh, the like really small alleyways are also to avoid enemies because you can see them coming on the map and then you can see like they get little red arrows above them yeah. when you approach them. So you can like slip into an alleyway to avoid them if you don't want an encounter. But again, combat super easy. So Damon, I, I can't stress enough how much uh, the Yakuza franchise, all of them are Damie games. You would love them. Yeah. They're on Game Pass. Yeah. Play them. <laughs> yep, I saw that. I, I, so I many really of them sure. are on Game Pass, and there's more coming in March, I think. Um, there's a, uh, a we're showing footage now of the of the guy running, and I think it's funny that we just talked about not doing this. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I forget what I was going to say. But yeah, more Yakuza. I don't know where to go after this. Is what I was going to ask Justin. Uh, zero. Okay. And zero that just came was, out too, right? Well, it's a few years old, so you know there was Yakuza one through five and maybe there's a six I actually lose track but zero is a prequel and it's one of the only prequels of all time where like i would actually say play the prequel first it actually enriches and changes the context of the first game the answer of like whenever there's a sprawling video game franchise and they're like what order should i play them and the answer is always just play them in the order they came out like it doesn't matter when they're set play them in the order they came out because that's how everyone always experienced them right and like 
I think Yakuza is one of the very, very rare examples of um, play Zero first because Yakuza 1 has these two characters that are best friends. And then in Zero, you get to see them come up and like see their relationship form and build. And then it, uh, it enriches the first game if you go back to it. I can't think of any other prequel where I, where I would normally say watch the prequel first. I read a review this weekend and uh, I was I'm, I'm a little bit worried and I'll just toggle the, the, the difficulty at this point. But apparently you hit a grindy stretch at some point. I forget which chapter it was it was saying, but it was like apparently at some point you hit a, a, a place where it's like, well, I guess I need to. I think he said he spent four or five hours or like some big percentage of his game. I think Tristan reviewed it uh, uh, grinding just to get through that part of the game which is like, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. That's one of those like yeah. RPG qualities where it's like, we know people are going to want to spend a hundred hours in this thing. And I mm-hmm. think you could easily do so in like a dragon um, based on like the pacing and how many they do a really good job. Like the criticism around cyberpunk, for instance, was they didn't do such a good job interweaving some of the sub stories and uh, side quests and whatnot, as opposed to like a dragon does it really well. They like, indicate little dialogue options on the map, which feels exciting because the map feels manageable, especially in the way that you're revealing other elements of the map. So you're just kind of in this congested area and often you'll just randomly stumble on it too. Um, and yeah, you can see some of the goofy combat here where uh, some people hit people with purses. And also there are, uh, also speaking of cyberpunk, there are also dildos that you can get as um, weapons in this game too. There's Why a, does um, that make you think of cyberpunk instead of Saints Row the Third? I think yeah. That's true. I think, I think it's just a more recent example. All right, yeah, and remember when uh, Tom, our reviewer, is reviewing Cyberpunk, he was like, you guys aren't going to believe this aspect of this yeah. game. Um, there's a, uh, uh, the combat here is is kind of fun. There's some little timing elements to it. So it's like sometimes you have to like, you know, mash the button or sometimes you have to like hit block at the exact right time. And it, and it reminds me of uh, the Paper Mario series. Mm-hmm. It's like turn based with QTE, mm-hmm. as I've been calling it. Mm-hmm. But it, it works. It adds a little bit of that action element. Um, and then, yeah, blocking is just sort of like a, a permanent thing. But depending on your move, you either have to jam X or hit Y at the appropriate time. And you start to kind of learn those quote unquote combos. Mm-hmm. They're not really. Well, combos. this sounds great. I'll have to check it out on Game Pass uh, after yeah. I'm, fi- I'm finished playing the other Game Pass game that I've been playing uh, since I beat God of War. It's a game I haven't played in 10 years. Are there any guesses as to what it could be? Well, before we get into it, Like a Dragon's not on Game Pass, just so you know. Oh, well, Every okay. other so. Yakuza game will be on Game Pass by March, and so I think it will be just around the corner. But oh, got it. Is it, it really is not? coming out on PlayStation 5 right now. It's getting like an upgrade on PlayStation 5 right now. Mm-hmm. Damn yeah. it. I'm going to guess that the game you're playing is Skyrim. It absolutely is. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Good on you. I haven't uh, played it since it was first released 10 years ago, and I've just been having such a great time. It actually, I'm playing on Series X, of, of course, uh, and it looks really nice. Really? And there are, it's the first game I've played that there are no load times. Yeah. Like the promise mm. of no load times. Yeah. It can make it happen on a 360 game. <laughs> you can fast travel, enter a new environment. It just, it just it brings up the loading screen, and then it goes away. You're right back into it. Tina, does Yakuza great. do that for you? Yeah, I mean, like, it has quick resume, so I alternate between, like, you know, I'll, I'll turn on Disney Plus or something, and then I quickly go back that, to Yakuza, and it's good to go. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that um, the, the the load times, though, have, like, a, a note. They'll be, like, you know, a tip, and, I, and it's never yeah. there long enough for me to read it. Yep, 100%. <laughs> you know you can cycle through those tips, but, yeah, the yeah. second you hit A yeah, to cycle through, if you're on Xbox like me, yeah, it's yeah. just it's quickly loaded back right back into, which is great. It feels great. Mm-hmm. Skyrim is so good. Yeah, I, I, there's so much I, I had forgotten about it. I, I played a lot of it, but I never beat it. Um, the first time, I think I made it to the college in Winterhold, ah. and then uh, that's like the last thing I remember. And that's actually just where I caught up to now in this playthrough. Wow! But it's like it's got it's got such a cool vibe when you're just out wandering uh, the countryside by mm-hmm. yourself, and it really you can see how many games were like inspired by this. What Obviously, is this Breath third of the Wild. View. Oh, it's I don't a know mod, what we're modded. Oh, this is person. the PS5 gameplay mod. Yeah. Um, uh, have you was, tried to go straight up a mountain web. on your horse yet? I haven't ridden a horse yet. I usually don't ride horses in games. What? No. Video game That's horses really, suck, man. What? Yeah, it's not really something I'm into. I like to just every, I like to every, explore on foot. No, every horse in a video game feels worse than just being on foot. <laughs> oh, well, what so about Red Dead that. 2? And you can turn on cinematic view and it just follows oh, the road. Yeah. And you you could pet your Amazing. horse oh. and then you get a you know, you get a nice little bonding with your horse. No, thank oh, you. No? no, thank you. So you guys... <laughs> Hate animals. I see. You heard it here on no, Spook. No, no. 
I, I like riding my giant wolf in uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Just really because fun. it's a wolf? It's because it's a giant wolf. Oh, you're such a yeah. horse hater. It's a dire wolf. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's really funny. There's like hundreds of characters in the game, and I think there are only five voice actors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that must stand <laughs> out now, huh? Oh man, the same guy is like a shopkeeper, yep. and a, a Jarl, <laughs> and then a dark elf wizard at the college. It's just, it's the same voices over and over and over again. I mean, that's so, why Arrow to the Knee was like a thing is because you just heard it all the time going in and yeah. out of the, the castle, right? Yeah. And also that map at the top is like, you know, that's what Assassin's Creed uses now as its map, right? Yeah. It felt, it felt, even though it's like a 10 year old oh, yeah. uh, game, that map felt very familiar to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, I love yeah, it. Anyway. I've played through it tw twice. I played through it when it was new, and I played through mm -hmm. it n maybe two years later when the Game of the Year edition came out, like, yeah. and with all the DLC. And in hindsight, I wish I would have saved that second playthrough for, like, you know, mm -hmm. five or six years later, because now it's like, I don't know if I can go through it a third time, but, like, you do get yeah. that itch, man. Oh, what a good yep. game. Yep, I'm having a blast. Uh, and then, Justin, what have you, what have you been playing? Not too much. I'm still playing Mario 3D World with uh, my daughter. By the way, ba Bowser's Fury is so good. Like, I know we talked about that, that, but, like, it's unbelievable how much better that is than 3D World, even though they're not separated <laughs> by, Seriously. like, that many years. Yeah. Um, but just the things that they figured out. I feel like 3D World was Nintendo just coming out of the tail end of, like, kind of figuring some things out about Mario and what they wanted Mario to be. And now, you know, Odyssey was in 3D. Uh, Bowser's Fury is... um. You know, too small to be a home run, but like, man, what's there is so so excellent. Um, we're also my daughter and I are also still playing Sackboy, and I said this sort of like, you know, mm, like maybe I like Sackboy more, dude. We played both this weekend, and we definitely like playing Sackboy together more than cool. 3D World. Um, yeah. hmm. I I don't know how like specific my experience is to like me in my life versus how like universal or global it is, but like playing them back to back, like oh let's play some Mario, okay let's play Sackboy, it's like. Sackboy, um, your co-op partner comes back every checkpoint you hit, and each level has five or six checkpoints. So even though my daughter is not very skilled at video games, like I can carry her. Like we get halfway through to the next checkpoint and she dies, and then I rush ahead to the next checkpoint and she comes back. Like Mario feels way less friendly compared to that. Like she dies fifteen seconds into a level and then is just dead. Like oh, sorry, you just can't, <laughs> you just can't play anymore. Um, and then she's also always really mad when um, she gets hit and loses her power up in Mario. She just keeps mm -hmm. asking me, why can't I be Cat Peach? Why can't I be Cat Peach? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you yeah. got hit. You lost mm -hmm. your power up. Whereas in, um, in Sackboy, Sa you keep power ups for the whole level. So you're like a little different version of Sackboy mm -hmm. for each level that you play through. Oh. And, um, and I, I know I mentioned this before. It's totally a tiny detail, but but not like it has big ramifications in practice. Whereas Sackboy does a way better job of zooming out the camera in a more generous way to keep both characters in frame. Um, playing Mario immediately after it, we're constantly leave leaving each other behind. And like one of us mm -hmm. goes off screen and they get bubbled back to like join their partner. And then like the bubble pops over a gap and then she's falling down a pit. Like it just feels way less friendly and more mean and less un nintendo like like less beginner friendly than sackboy does um which you know i don't know how many people are playing at co-op with young kids but that's been my experience and like i was kind of feeling that way but then after playing both games back to back this weekend like she's she's sort of like i don't want to play this anymore i want to play sackboy and i'm like yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> well i do want to try uh bowser's fury i still haven't played that oh myself. man that has two person co-op right but it's probably way too hard. The, this I haven't played two player co op, but the second player is just Bowser Jr. And so I think they're just like tapping. Oh, that actually would be easy. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I mean, it might be boring, but at least it wouldn't be a difficult platformy thing. I know in Bowser's Fury, reviewers talked about this, but like I had to experience for myself how different it feels that it's open world and like you just run, mm -hmm. like you just bounce off a spring and then you're in the next level and in the, the next obstacle course. Like, I didn't think it would feel that different. I'm like, I don't feel like it's that big a deal to pop back out to a map and then pop into a level. But like when you're actually playing it yourself and the freedom that you feel of like, there's a level over here, there's a level over there. And like, once you start, then um, the music changes and the whole atmosphere changes. Like it really, really does make a huge difference. And all the reviewers are right to bring that up and highlight how cool that is. 
let's move on to some news of the week. Uh, we now know that the, the uh, next chapter in Final Fantasy VII Remake is going to be the PS5 version called Final mm-hmm. Fantasy VII Remake Integrade. <laughs> so not part two or episode two. Uh, it's a PS5 version that has improved textures, <laughs> fog effects, lighting, faster load times, a new photo mode, support for DualSense uh, controllers, haptic feedback, playable in either performance mode, which is uh, 60 frames per second, or graphics mode, which prioritizes 4K resolution. And I there's also that. going to be... You hate that? Yeah, the new console, what? and I now I'm already switching between a mode. Let's you do I have to have... choose one. Like, come on. Well, it is That's true a... that so the God the PS5 version of God of War is 60 frames per second and 4K. Yeah, yep. of course, yep. of course, it's crazy to have to switch between that. Like that does not bode well for the next five years of the PlayStation Five. Hmm. Well, I was going to ask. Uh, I, I know. I think. I think all three of you liked Final Fantasy VII Remake more than I did. Uh, do you think you'll play it again on PS5? No. No. <laughs> I haven't finished it, so I'm really interested. I'll totally play the <laughs> stuff. Well, that's like DLC on top of it, essentially. Which is not yeah. standalone. Yeah. You still need the game. You still need the base, base game to play it, but it doesn't mean you need to replay all of a sudden. I mean, I, well, I I'm worried it. that it's going to be like, you know, only in Chapter 11. And you have to turn right at this one road, and then you get to no. play this one. Like, no, who knows? No. I don't. I, mean, I, I, I liked it okay. I, I liked it as, like, I have a lot of nostalgia and, like, love in my heart for Final Fantasy VII and the city of Midgar and, like, all the music and characters. And so seeing them in, like, Ultra HD like this was, like, totally amazing for, like, a, a nostalgia perspective. But, like, as a game, yeah. like, it's so padded out. It's so mm-hmm. sl- the pacing just felt all wrong. Um, I, I I don't know that I think it stands up as like an original experience if you don't have nostalgia for the original. Um, but I got a lot of enjoyment out of it just hearing that music again and all of that. Mm. No, no, I'm not interested in playing it again. Now they're going to be padding it out even more with this Ugh. extra episode. <laughs> Ugh. I never yeah. played the original, um, and I felt like it stood on its own for me, but. Maybe more so because I just I love Final Fantasy games and I totally buy into JRPGs on this level. Like I like some of the padding just because it gives you an excuse to exist in that world a little bit longer to play with combat systems if you enjoy it a little bit longer. Um, and a lot of it you can or can't participate. You can decide not to participate in if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I understand that a lot of it is riding on some of that nostalgia for people too, mm-hmm. and sometimes in a negative way. It wasn't everything that they wanted it to be. Yeah. yeah. I, I do appreciate that it's a free upgrade if you had the PS4 version. Yes. And um, uh, two PS5, but you don't get the yuffy stuff. Hey, this guy, yeah. real quick, how much does this guy look like Ryan McCaffrey, by the way? I don't know if they're going to show him again. I think we may have just missed it, but I noticed it when we watched the trailer. I think that that new character they showed looks just like him, but he may be, he may be gone. Sorry. Yeah, I need a visual oh, reference. Cool. I think um, he's. Yeah, I, I liked a lot uh, of about Final Fantasy VII Remake, but I totally agree with Justin. It just felt really, really super padded. And I'm also, I'm, I'm just kind of cynical about the whole rollout of the parts and the episodes and having no idea how, how long it's going to take or how many parts it's going to be. So then to see, like, without any sort of news or hint about the next episode, here's, here's you know, a, a downloadable episode chapter for Final Fantasy Remake. Uh, seven remake part one. You know, I'm a little cynical about all that. <laughs> we have full cat cam we have, going. <laughs> we got full cat cam for those that are listening to the podcast. watching. Uh, it is interesting that this is going to be the Final Fantasy Seven remake is going to be part of PlayStation Plus this month. Mm. That's cool. It's because that's like a yeah. you know, fairly recent huge game that's only a year old. Uh, but that does come with the caveat that you won't. Uh, just playing it on PlayStation Plus doesn't get you access to the PS5 version. You would still need to buy that. Yeah, you know, so not not integrate only the previous yeah. version. But if you exactly. own the previous version digitally, then you get the PS5 version free. <laughs> yeah, but not the DLC. So uh, right. integrate is a really, really mm-hmm. silly word that doesn't even look cool. I don't know why they'd use it. But <laughs> no, uh, it's it, it's interesting in the sense that it it's saying like, you know, that word implies like a transformation more than it does like an interlude, which is, I think is like a, probably a more a- appropriate word for this or an intermission, but an integrate is like something that transitions into something else. So like, clearly they want to bring this, uh, that's a little hint at like uh, bringing this onto PS5 forever. And, and you know what we're going to see the next game be built around. 
weird though. Justin, do you have? Do you know about this? The, the, there was also a Final Fantasy VII mobile game announced that basically just lets you watch the story. Is that do I, do I understand that correctly? I saw the trailer. I didn't. That wasn't my takeaway from it. I think it's just mm-hmm. an, the, my takeaway. Just watching the trailer. I didn't. I don't know if there's like supplemental reading I could do about that. Was that it's just another. You're right. <laughs> uh, my takeaway was that it's just another Final Fantasy VII remake with just an isometric viewpoint, and it's on mobile devices. And they said it's going to tell, it's episodic, and it's going to tell the entire story of Final Fantasy VII. So, Dirge of Cerberus and Advent Children, and like uh, all of that. So, like whatever arc, you know, all the Final Fantasy VII related media, it's going to pull it all together into like one thing. But all, all told, from this like. It's not accurate to call it chibi, but the stylized art style on mobile devices. I think it looks cool. Like, you know, the people that wanted Final Fantasy VII Remake to be more, you know, sort of true and traditional to the original with turn-based combat and, um, and you know, sort of characters on, on a little bit smaller screen instead of full blast HD thing. Like, I think it's going to appeal to them. Apparently, I didn't, I, I didn't catch this at the time. Apparently, they also announced a Final Fantasy Battle Royale game for mobile. Oh. What? Yeah, I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna highlight that one out of all of the announcements. That's the most absurd. This, one. I, I'm learning about this just now. And then this is from Tech Radar. The second game, Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis, is a pint-sized remake of Final Fantasy VII that likes to abbreviate the game's plot into a series of highlights, much like Final Fantasy XV Pocket Edition did. Yeah, so. I don't know how abbreviated it is, but I know it's episodic. Well, I watched the trailer for the Battle Royale Final Fantasy, and honestly, if I was going to play a Battle Royale, it might be a Final <laughs> Fantasy version of one. It's pretty good. I guess it's only on mobile, though. That's too bad. Yeah, it's only, I think, only iOS, Android. Um, but I suppose that's kind of the premise. Like, Fortnite's huge on mobile as well, and um, PUBG I mobile mean, is also huge. Like, the multiplayer in Final Fantasy XV was so good. I, I don't know if I've talked about it before, but it was like they put a little mini, but like not that many, but they put Monster Hunter in final fantasy it was like a game inside a game sort of like gta online so it's like hmm. square enix has some expertise like it was so much better than it had any right to be that like you know i don't know like that i don't know what team is making it but like i i have more faith than i would have that they can do this up right and do it in a cool way okay let's check in with the listeners hey listeners howdy Listeners, remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com, just like Big Tony style did. Oh. Hey! <laughs> it's been a while since we heard from our good friend, Big Tony style. He said, we've seen a huge trend in remakes of games from the 90s and early 2000s. I think a lot of this is not only driven by iconic franchises from our childhood, but also the limitations of older consoles. This has me wondering, when the Omega Cops gather around their Florida retirement home, to record episode 2000, are there any games you're going to want remade from the ground up from contemporary consoles? So first of all, when I retire, it's not going to be in Florida. Same. How, Definitely wait, not. Can we do the math real quick? How many episodes are we on now? I did. Uh, the math on oh, no. episode 2000 should be in about 26 years. So that, yeah. that kind of works out. Mm, yeah. uh, I hope we retire <laughs> that young. Wait, that it's, doesn't it's make sense. Oh, yeah. It's oh, a yeah, little young. I mean, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, sounds that just about right for me. <laughs> um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, since you you prepped us with this question. I, 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 it's funny because I think that, you know, if you think about the technology side of it, like the thing that games will progress on is, you know, AI, uh, immersion, potentially, you know, brain inserts and stuff like that. So I'm trying to think like what, when I think of games that I want to revisit now that were like really primitive back in the day, it's ones that I want to like live in that world for. I want to like mm-hmm. be part of that game because it's better than reality. So it's like you have, I'd have to think like 25 years from now, I'd be participating in some sort of game that's so immersive that it'd be like, I want to be here. And I can't really think of a lot of games that are out right now that are like that, but that's where my, my mind is. And I was thinking of like, you know, then there's another angle like death stranding needs another chance right like i think that game's really cool and it could use like a ground up remake but i don't know if i want to like live in that world because it seems so cold it's just iceland yeah. you know so cold I mean, um the so way that I, this if there's something beautiful and lovely kind of and, and, and again I, I was actually thinking about final fantasy also because like that's such a cool world to look at and like but it, 
it's also like full of garbage and it's overcrowded and like who knows it doesn't seem like that fun to live in either so i need like a game that's like florida that i want to experience that's out now i <laughs> um yeah i i mean i don't the way that this question was phrased like by the time i'm in a retirement home like people that are in retirement homes now don't want to watch i love lucy in color they want to relive <laughs> the classic thing and like that they have their memories that's for true. like i don't want any game to be remade I want Super Metroid <laughs> and Halo Three and like what and about Portal that Black 2. Mirror episode though, where the the olds are yeah. in permanent, you know, virtual space retirement? Like that's yeah. that's the idea, right? Like that's I, I, I somewhere they that. live that's better than the U.S. I like Flash on and think about San Junipero that episode all the time. It's so mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Like by the time I'm old and in a retirement home, I just want them to like hook up, uh, you know, a PS One and an N sixty four and uh, SNES. You, you know, I just want all that hooked up to a CRT TV, and that's what I <laughs> that's what I want. Yeah. Morba says that uh, by the time that comes around, Horizon Zero Dawn will have happened, like realistically in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's you true. don't want to play the game anymore; it'll just be Horizon. You just Zero exist Dawn. in it, yeah. Hopefully not. Well, yeah. Um, I thought of like uh, because we've talked about before about playing games together, and then maybe having that be part of an episode. So, if you think about it from that perspective thinking about a multiplayer game um i would probably since i've talked about it so much on the show too i would probably do like left for dead one or two so that we could play rounds together in an updated world mm-hmm. but sam like your perspective makes me think like okay everything's going to be in vr it's going to feel like we're actually there where would i want to visit and mm-hmm. then like bioshock infinite comes to mind because it's cool oh, to yeah. think about living in a, uh, a city in the sky although that game has its issues and then i went to bioshock original because i was thinking that's a better game but whole like that's kind of a terrifying environment yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah mm-hmm. but maybe it's before I, the fall it's just like a just a nice place to hang out oh it's still not that great even before the fall though <laughs> they're, they're gearing not up for some bad news no yeah um yeah i mean i think there's only been like i've played many many multiplayer games in my career but the only one that was like that became sort of like a lifestyle game for me were me and my friends every night you know we're meeting online in this game that was halo 2 halo 3 Halo Reach, and then it kind of tapered off after that. Um, and so those are my enduring memories of my youth, like pre-kids, even pre-marriage, like every night just playing Halo. And like that online hangout with my friends was like, that's when I experienced that. And so um, that's what it would have to be. But again, I don't want to see it remade. I just want like, just give me give me the experience, that, experience that, I, yeah. that I grew up with. I would do mm-hmm. Destiny 1 with you guys. Yeah. Both yeah. that and Halo are good ones where it's like, if it is more immersive and it's interesting, like you're in like a, a really cool space environment that's still going to feel futuristic and sci-fi and interesting because we have such slow progress with space program stuff here. And, you know, I don't, I don't ever I want to go to space and fly around in a spaceship, but I <laughs> absolutely want that to be the most, that's my favorite type of game immersion. Like even VR right now, I'd much rather play a space shooter than anything else in VR. It just, it feels awesome. And it's like being in Star Wars. And I love the Halo universe. So I think that'd be a really cool one to uh, build out. It's also like tropical and pretty and neat. Like the, the mm-hmm. Halo ring is gorgeous. You know, it's got like alpine forests and like beautiful beaches and stuff like that. Like it's, it's a, you know, a utopia as designed. Uh, but then it turns out, you know, it's like some kind of super weapon or something. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that part. <laughs> Yeah, it would be hard. It's hard to imagine something like God of War, uh, which you know just got the PS5 version. It's hard to imagine that needing a remake ever. Like, I just can't. I can't throw my mind forward 26 years to yeah. think about how good graphics are going to be then. However, 26 years ago was 1995. Okay, graphics have certainly uh, improved a lot since yeah. then. But I was thinking about like something like Skyrim, which I'm also playing. Like I mentioned, you know, that game. Like I said, it looks nice, but it's pretty far from photorealistic. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe someday you'll be able to take games like that and just play in complete photorealism. Uh, that would be pretty nice. I would take Mirror's Edge also, because I feel like there's a mm-hmm. lot you could do in 26 oh, yeah. years with that kind of a game. Or like Titanfall, just anything yeah. where I'm still stuck on this, we're in a VR version of this. And then like the, yeah. The, yeah. just like the the ability to to like basically walk on the side of buildings would be very cool. Yeah, like Crackdown is like that too. Like any type of superhero feeling is something that's like, you know, either too dangerous by the time you're, you know, retired or uh, impossible <laughs> in the case of a lot of these things. So it, it's still fun to experience that that feeling. However, it also like I'm not 
I wouldn't say like I have like a terrible height phobia or anything, but I have a healthy mm. sense of not falling off the edges of things. And like, <laughs> I've already, you get that little brain trip when you're just like, you know, in, in a yeah. VR headset and like you see the edge of something like games can get to a place where they're scary and not in like a horror way or anything, but like, you know, like this sucks to be this out of control or, you know, on top of things. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to have my brain start, you know, adjusting to a really unsafe situations if things are very realistic. That's true. Roller coasters are bad. Yeah, I hate roller coasters. So it's like I, I don't even like, you know, I don't really have a desire to have put a roller coaster on my face right now. Like, am I going <laughs> to want that when it also can make my stomach feel bad? Like, I don't think so. Yeah, and we're old and frail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would definitely love to see. I don't need to see them in a virtual environment or, or anything like that. But I think we talked last week or a few weeks ago about how amazing it is that the Halo Master Chief collection exists, where it's all the games in one launcher, but also all your career progress and all your stats and all your everything. It has like a layer that sits on top of the individual game experiences. And it's like, mm -hmm. I hope that we get to a place where other games and other franchises are doing that. Like I want Assassin's Creed hub where I can launch into any of those games or Mario or Zelda or something of that nature. Like, I don't think it'll ever, ever happen because, because capitalism, but like, that's what retirement me would like to see. I have two other technological points I want to make. One is that uh, computers by that point, uh, w w and using the term computer is going to be really funny then, which I already think it is, uh, are going to be so advanced that they can, they can read, they'll be able to redesign a game based on your parameters anyway. So like you could probably play a Breath of the Wild that's randomly generated every day of your, every second if you wanted to. Like that's how that's that that's the where we're going with computer processing. So technically, remakes are a really interesting topic because I can just say like I want to play a, a Super Mario Odyssey level, and I want this computer to design me three hundred of them, and they'll be as good as anything Miyamoto ever made. Like I I totally believe that'll be possible. So that's that's yeah. that's one thing. That's an interesting way remakes can go. The other is that AI is already getting very good at playing video games, and we will all be able to play uh, games of any type of any era of anything that will just be like playing with a human. So it'll be so good because humanity is so terrible and playing games online is so horrible for, uh, uh, in some situations, if you have your group of friends and everything, it's fine. And if you have th a thick skin and you're young, it's always fine as we all have experienced, but, uh, it's gotten so much worse for me that like, I kind of do want to see what it would be like to play, you know, a one versus 100 Fortnite game, uh, with a bunch of really nice people that act like nice people and are also very good to play with. This is Taylor from Wisconsin. He says, longtime listener. Thanks for all the great scoops. Last few years I've been listening. I was listening to Damon's other show after the PlayStation State of Play, Next Gen Console Watch. Shout out to Damon for putting together another great show, as well as Ryan McCaffrey and Jonathan Dornbush as great guests. Anyway, during the show, you talked about <laughs> last week's Next Gen Console Watch poll about the DualSense drift issue. At the end, Damon kind of brushed aside the poll that said about 10% of respondents had problems with drift. I was kind of shocked because I think that number is totally insane. Well, Taylor from Wisconsin, in my defense, I had someone in my ear shouting, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> and we hadn't and we hadn't even gotten to the poll yet. So I was like, oh, OK, that's our show. I think we've got some poll results here. Hey, 10 percent didn't have any problem. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Borba has we added don't himself. It was him. <laughs> don't, that's true. We don't normally have time constraints on us when we're recording Next Gen Console Watch. But this was a, oh, a right. unique case where it was a post show for the state of play. And we had to hit specific timing for our, um, one of our uh, sort of distribution platforms where we put it on uh, Samsung televisions and they have commercial breaks that they have to account for. So it had to be the exact time. So that's what was going on there. But actually, now that you pointed out, yeah, 10% of respondents, even on an IGN poll does sound like a lot for a, yeah. a brand new $500 console. Was that 10% for drift or was it for problems? Because I, I remember setting problems up that with poll. drift. So, okay. So that's just, and then other people had other problems too. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I think 5% said maybe other problems, something like that. Okay. So 15% of people have a problem with their PlayStation controller already. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, yeah. According to our poll results. Seems like a lot. Yeah. It does seem like a lot. Both yeah, mine are okay. I only have one, but mine is okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's enough to where class action lawsuits are now being advised against and filed. So certainly mm -hmm. affecting a lot of people in the same way that the Joy-Cons for the Switch seem to have the same drift problem. It is true. I do uh, like to point out, though, that the class action lawsuit is brought up by the same law firm that <laughs> brought up the uh, class action lawsuit against Nintendo for Joy-Con drift. 
Well, they're very familiar now. We got some drift chasers. They're not ambulance chasers. (laughs) They're drift chasers. I mean, I did. I. I do wonder, there's not that many, you know, PS5 hasn't been out that long. So it's like, okay, so what's it going to look like in another three months or another three months? And people's, you know, people's rate of play is also pretty different. Like, I play video games almost every night, but I'm not using my PS5 all that much. And so, like, maybe it has less to do, like, maybe almost everyone will have this problem once they hit 100 hours of, of, you know, them using that controller in their hands. And, like, Mm -hmm. you know, they just haven't gotten there yet. So, um the console's still pretty new that like, I, you know, I don't know, maybe it'll amount to nothing, but like, it should probably be sending up some alarm bells if it's like already sort of revealed itself this quickly. Mm-hmm. Which I believe was the same deal with the Nintendo switch too. And then there, it certainly went through its ebbs and flows of, okay, some people are identifying it, but how widespread is this? Okay. A lot of people yeah. are identifying it. Okay. A majority of the people have been, um, mm-hmm. pair has every single, variation of a switch uh, i forget mm-hmm. what he said but he he gave us numbers too out of all of his switches how many had joy con drift problems wow mm-hmm. i didn't know that that's really interesting good data points I, and like that shows too that like you don't have to it's not like wear and tear necessarily if mm-hmm. you if like Paris not sitting there playing with every single joy con controller he has all the time <laughs> he plays he gets them he he takes them out of the box which is which is actually totally insane to quote the, the, the writer, <laughs> uh, and then probably plays them for a little bit and then determines if they have drift. You know, did you did you see that the um, in the, the legal uh, language, there's like this dry explanation for what drift is, and it's it's really good. It's like, you know, a, a player, uh, it's like, it describes it as like when, you know, a player is, player's control input does not directly affect the you know direction their, their character is moving or something. It's just some just dry explanation for what Joy-Con drift is. I thought that was great to have. It feels doubly bad because both the Joy-Con and the PS5 controller are really expensive. Um, yeah. What, is the PS5 controller $70? 60 That sounds right without me looking anything up. Great. It's also it's also <laughs> hard to get them. So, hmm. you know, if they break, it's, it can be really yeah. frustrating to have to back order them or not have them in, in Switch's case for all of last year. Yep, it's that's 70, what was, that's exactly what happened to me, me is when Animal... Thank you, Tina. Is mm-hmm. when um, Animal Crossing came out was when my Joy-Con started to drift. And thankfully, Animal Crossing is not like a twitchy game. So it's like I was sort of able to wrestle the Joy-Con and get it working. But then they were, it was a pandemic and they were sold out everywhere. And like I couldn't mm-hmm. get a controller for like a month. And, um, and I don't, I think I ended up paying slightly above MSRP on eBay for one um, just to get another one. Um, so yeah, it feels bad. Um, I guess it just feels worse than like the Xbox One X, no, Series X controller is like, you know, a little bit more old school, a little bit lower tech and cheaper. You know, I think they're like 40 bucks. So they frequently go on sale for that price. And like, that feels more like a commodity than like a high end piece of tech, like the dual sense. Mm-hmm. So it's like, shit, I don't want to be paying $70 for another one of these. Sure. Remember when all we had to care about was uh, analog dust and where the heck that came from? Yeah. Nintendo mm-hmm. 64 controller just had that gray dust in the, in the Ugh. joystick all the time. What Gross. the hell was that? Uh- and then everyone wrecked their hands playing Mario Party, and then they had to send out that disclaimer. Like people had these like hand burns. <laughs> and then the PlayStation Two controllers melted. Yep. What? So I, I don't know if you remember this, Damon, but in the office in uh, the San Fran- the Brisbane office when we were in Brisbane, yeah. uh, that we had the, uh, PS Two controllers that the analog sticks would always be wet. Yep. They had this sheen of like. Oh. A, De- yeah, I know. Degrading what you mean. I plastic. Hate, yeah. The rubber yeah. like broke down on whatever was on the oh, analog it was sticks. Brutal, man. I do remember that now. Very unpleasant. I'll take the drift. Reminds me of and that, that Mountain Dew us- can. <laughs> the yeah, liquid that brings through. Can. For <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I, that was an interesting thing because I had two boxes at my desk of unopened things because I don't open collectible things, and it was like the it was like you know the NES. What was it called? the nes mini and the super nes mini and they got these stains on the bottom of them and it's like what the heck is going on here and i like picked them up and they had these stains i just don't know what it was and so uh I, I actually replaced them and then uh one day i was like i had this like mountain dew can on my desk it was it was from halo 3 it was a uh, between tina and i's desk and i picked it up and it was dead empty oh. <laughs> but unopened entirely like no holes anywhere in it visibly in any way and then a and, sticky syrupy substance just mysteriously yeah. below it. <laughs> and that had flowed down, you know, Ugh. over 
you know, maybe a year or something, just like little tiny micro amounts to like soak those boxes. So I put that all together and then I got a containment system for it. I still have it packed up with all my desk stuff, wherever that is. That was gross. Containment mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, was it was a cup. A, it was a cup. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you describe it that way? Because it looked like it. it was like this perfect whiskey highball cup and I put the can in it and it was a perfect containment system. All right, we're driving Damon crazy. <laughs> I think, I think Damon wants us to stop talking about this. <laughs> and that brings us to Video Game 20 Questions. Our suggestion this week comes from Ryan in Syracuse, New York. Let the questioning begin. Would we have gotten promotional material for this game? Oh, that's good. Would we have? It, we, yeah. You certainly could. You could have. I mean, I've only been here three years. So have you guys gotten promotional material for this game? Well, no. Your question was, would the, we're going with the question, could we have gotten promotional materials for this game? The answer is yes. Mm. Got it. Meaning it had what marketing if, money behind it. What if we just refuse to ask questions? Then what would Damon do? We're the ones <laughs> that actually have the power here. <laughs> <laughs> just Definitely end the episode short. Replace the cast. <laughs> um, uh, would, would people describe this game as having a good story? Um, I don't think so. Mm. Although I would say it's not like it has a bad one. It's just that I don't think the story is really what the draw is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there multiplayer in this game? No. Seems, Seems like a, kind of a bummer of a game if the story is no good and it's just single player. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's a gameplay game. It's like Disgaea. Mm-hmm. Like no one's really mm-hmm. there for like the lore. Um, it's like Robotron. Game's great. No one's there mm-hmm. for the story. Yeah, it's a pretty good story, though. Mutants, future. They're not robots. Um, are you? Wait, they're robots, aren't they? Or are you mm-hmm. a robot? There's also you're, like a giant brain. Okay. You're a robot that's saving humans from mutants. Got it. <laughs> uh, okay. Did this game come out in the '90s? No. Can you play this on Switch? No, that's five. Mm. Is it part of the franchise? No. Uh, Is it part of a French fries? (laughs) (laughs) Was it made in Japan? Yes. Uh, Was it uh, published by a developer that has an E3 press conference? No. Mm. So Mm. none of the big three. Or the tertiary six. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, I don't know, like Capcom. Can you imagine an E3 press conference from Capcom? Just if they just came back with it, it'd be so great. They got the regular ass Mega Man. They got their Resident Evils. Mm-hmm. They'd have fighting they, games. They'd spend uh, they'd spend 35 minutes on just terrible Resident Evil battle royales and just stuff <laughs> that nobody cares about just to make you wait for like the six minute gameplay demo of like. Yeah. You know, the next big mainline Resident Evil game. Monster Hunter mobile games. And Mon- um, I guess they do have Mon Hun. That's true. Uh, huh. Does this place take play? Does this game take place in a contemporary uh, Earth environment? No. Mm. It's Gradius. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Konami has press conferences. It did. Uh, I shouldn't have asked the 90s question because now I don't know which direction to go. Yeah, I don't either. I don't get well, the press materials seem to indicate to me that's not an 80s game. <laughs> that's true. Unless it had like a reissue or something. Uh, is this a well, oh, yeah, never mind. I don't want to ask. Does that. this have 2D graphics? No, that's 10. Okay, mm. is it an RPG? Um, is it an RPG? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, was this a, a, a platform exclusive? No. Are there vehicles okay. in this game? Are there vehicles in this game? No. Mm. Rush the dog counts as a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> Did this... Uh, uh, Oh, man, I really wish I knew what, what platform this came out for. 
but I don't know how to narrow it down. Xbox and PlayStation. Maybe PC. It's Japanese, so I wonder if it's a, a, like a weird like um it could know, be it could be a Game Capcom Cube-y game thing. Yeah, it could be Capcom. Is it a Capcom game? No. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, we crossed that one off the list. Well, but there's not that many. Like, so Sony and Nintendo hold press conferences, and so did Konami. And we know it's not Capcom. But we yeah, know it could it's, be like Natsume or just, just a million, you know? That's true. It could be. It's totally um, Harvest Moon. <laughs> uh, is this a. Does this game require like Twitch reflexes? Do you have to be able to do things quickly in this game? Yes. That's 15. Oh, cool. What, what was the franchise question? I can only remember the French fries question. <laughs> there, it's not part of a franchise. Okay. It's, it's not part of a French fries. Either, yeah. Okay, um, um, okay so it's a one-off. I guess I forgot about that. Well, that could have helped us narrow it down. It's a one-off. It's not from one of the big companies. It's an action game. No, it's just from a smaller... Maybe it's not an action game. It just requires twitchy controls. Well, but like... Which you that know, could be like... Action. That could be like and Cooking Mama. No. That well, requires twitchy controls and isn't an but action I mean, like, game. It's not a. It's not any sort of like chill out walking. What was the vehicle question? No vehicles. There aren't vehicles. Okay. This is interesting because it doesn't take place in contemporary Earth, and there's no vehicles, so I'm tempted to not say it's in the future. I yeah. I feel like that would mean that it's like a past game with horses. There's always vehicles in the future. Do horses right. count as vehicles? No. We've addressed this, right? Um, Damon's looking something up, which makes me really happy. <laughs> uh, does this take place in the past? Yes. Mm-hmm. That was very definitive. 16. Okay. Do, do you count gameplay in the past? We have do, no idea what era it came out in. So, but wait, wait, wait. <laughs> do you count, like, this is not one of my 20 questions, Damon. Would you say that Skyrim takes place in the past? <clears throat> That's a good question. Uh, um, well, dragons are extinct now, so. <laughs> See, because I often it's like, like it's like what's what's the fairest way to answer that for you guys? You know, yeah, it's a historical past. Yeah, we can just ask different questions. And I would say that. It, that question is actually appropriate for this game as well. You would just say it's, it's unclear. It's a, it's, you asked if it's a story, but it's a version of our history. You could say that. Yeah. A version of a history that we okay. would recognize. Are okay. there fantastical creatures in this game? Yes. Okay. What's, what, what was the giant enemy crab game? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a Japanese created fantasy game. Yeah. Not an RPG. Yeah, so, so that's why I was thinking about all like the Total War games, but they're all you know turn-based RPG strategy games. A- and they were made by Sega. Sega. So could this be a Sega game? They, they never could be had a Muso. Yeah, yeah. Toy Tecmo does those, right? Yeah. Yes. Um. Or oh. you know, or Ninja Gaiden from Tecmo. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a series. Yeah. Good point. I guess they're both series, yeah. So it would have to be a standalone like one of those. I think um, I think it could be the giant enemy crab game. What was that game yeah. called? Or uh, it could be It's cross platform, which is weird. A lot of a lot oh, of Japanese games right. just come out on PlayStation. That's right. I forgot about that one. Yeah. yeah. Did this come out on a Nintendo console? No. I I can't get this without the, the year, I don't think. Or the, the the era, so I'd really like to know if this was like in, you know, an Xbox 360 era game or something. But I just don't, I don't know if that would help at this point. I think we basically lost this one. Well, we can't lose if we just stop asking questions. I want to remind <laughs> yeah, you. That's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. Um, did this come out in the 360 era? No. Great. And that brings us to the the twentieth question, which has to be a guess. So, okay, so we lost. Um, but I'm having a hard time even like, I'm like, oh, it could be like a Ninja Gaiden-y game, but they're all part of a series. It's multi- Can I, can I let you guys know where you got lost? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You asked if uh, if it was from a publisher that has an E3 press conference, and so you said, it's, okay, it's not any of the big three, but like the biggest 
publisher doesn't have an E3 press conference. Oh, is it like Sekiro? Oh. It is Sekiro. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's awesome. I can't believe we got it in there in the 11th hour. <laughs> well, that doesn't count well, as a win. Yeah, we lost. That counts as a Aww. win. <laughs> really? Why? It we never count? guessed. We, we didn't get our yeah. 20th. Damon no, gave us a very blatant yeah. hint. Yeah, I gave We've you gotten hints before. the biggest hint. Yeah, yeah I think well, hints are fun. It, it actually has mm-hmm. less to do, Damon, with it being such a big company and more to do with it having a Western publisher. That's why yeah, I, that's that's why, also, that's why I, I mean, wasn't zeroing in on it. This is a very unusual game for Activision to publish. It's true. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Well, 2019 is when that game came out. Could have gotten promotional materials for it. Sure, so there's not is. two of them? No. No? Not yet. Although it is kind of, you know, people think of it as like, you know, part of the Souls-like series. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh. Okay. Well, I don't know if we won that or not. So. I think we won it. I think so, too. Well, the good news is, right after this recording, you're going to get another chance. Because, uh, <laughs> yes. dear yeah, listeners and viewers, we're going to record a second episode for you. It's 100 questions uh, beginning right after this episode concludes. So that is all the scoops we have for you this week. Uh, remember, you can always reach us at the email address, uh, gamescoop at IGN.com. Be sure to hit me up with any questions you have about the uh, move for the show on YouTube. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Justin. Thank you you to Borba working behind the scenes. My name is Damon. This is IGN Gamescoop, and we're out.